All right. Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Learning Tech Talks, where we explore the landscape of learning technology while cutting through the fluff to answer the questions you need answered to make the right decision when building your digital learning ecosystem. So today I'm joined by Steve Deneen and Reese Giles from Fuse Universal, and we're talking about using technology to remove barriers to learning instead of creating them. And for those of you who are joining us live, be sure to give us a thumbs up share the post or tag in someone who would benefit from the conversation. And to get things started, we're not talking about learning technology. You've had 14 minutes to prepare for this. And the question for this week is, if you could meet anyone, and the rule was they have to be dead now, they can't be dead post today, who would it be and why? And we'll start with Steve, who who was asking around, that, trying to break <laughs> all the rules. So I am very curious to hear where you landed. I thought about this deeply, and, and I figured we should own, we should ask the person who's probably the only person that hasn't been asked this question. I, I'd like to bring back JFK, and I want his opinion on who shot him. Ooh, okay. So curiosity behind the JFK assassination. I like it. I like it. Do you have your theories? I am curious. Uh, I do, but I'm going to hold that to the end. Oh, okay, yeah, there we go. We'll, we'll keep people. We'll keep people tuned in for that. All right. How about how about you, Reese? Well, mine feels pretty boring now that you've just said that, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, a different Steve, actually, Steve Jobs. Um, okay. So, you know, really do do look up to everything that he's done. Um, you know, the uh, well, I, I suppose there's just so many questions that you'd want to ask. And I think everybody on this stream would probably be uh, would think he would be a great dinner guest, right? Okay. Okay. And that's why it worked when Steve recruited you with the Steve Jobs quote. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Got it. So, so many things, so many things are making sense now. So many things are making sense. <laughs> yeah, uh, so for, yeah. So for those of you watching, go ahead and, and post your your answers to that one in the comments. I think for me, mine is mine would probably change on a day-to-day -day basis, but I think it's January. Uh, and so this one popped immediately into mind. We just celebrated Martin Luther King Day. And I think what really was inspirational about that and why I'd like to talk to him was I'm always fascinated by people who have led tremendous change that that was socially unpopular, that, that people weren't necessarily always in alignment with and, and what that was like to lead that and the challenges they faced. So that's that's my answer to that one. So thank you for that. Um, you're both joining me from London. So your day your day is is almost over, but let's get into this. So we're talking about Fuse Universal. Uh, to, to help set the stage for everybody, what is your elevator pitch or description of, so what is, what is Fuse? So, so I think, I think the way we want to frame that, right, is, is what yeah. change we're trying to bring to the world. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and I think, so our Uber focus is recognizing that learning, learning technology can play a far bigger role than maybe it has in, in the last 10, 15 years. And I think there's probably two goals that we want to try to make sure that both our technology and, and, and our people drive. And that's how do we really start to use technology now to drive performance in individuals and organizations. So measurable difference um, by the yeah. things that we get involved in doing. And, and second, obviously, how do we make learning, learning technology so attractive that it continues to be a, a, both a, a retention and attraction strategy. So I think everything that we build and everything we think about in terms of our learning ecosystem or the hub of what is Fuse and the partners we build is one of the components we need to connect together that can allow different people, different audiences to create the experiences that allow us to drive that behavioral and performance change. Okay. Okay. Anything you would add to it, Reese? Well, maybe what he says, we'll go there. <laughs> but um, I suppose the only thing I would add to that is that uh, before I joined Fuse, I was a client. And so I've actually seen this on, on the, the client side. And for, for me, the ability to be able to democratize uh, the you know, content creation process and really bring L&D closer to the actual business so that people in the business can actually control some of that learning is such a powerful tool, you know, and then being able to find experts and being able to surface that knowledge, and I'm sure we'll talk more about this later on, you know, it is for me uh, one of the biggest things, the biggest changes we actually made uh, in that company. Okay. So with, and this is one where, you know, I think in our industry as a, as a whole, we, we historically, the LMS has been the cornerstone, if you will. And I think it's taking a, a pretty, a lot of heat for, for good reason. Uh, and, and I know that in a lot of the marketing, the things that I've read about what you do, it's about, 
you know, removing those barriers. So what are some of those barriers that you saw or you looked at from a problem statement? You know, you're talking about democratizing this education. You're trying to do things differently. What were some of those core things that you looked at and said, we can do better than that? We can do better. Yeah, so, so I think when I first started, right, so our, our journey, our journey began after I had a more traditional LMS company building school courses and boring millions and millions of people around the world, which we've finished the global tour of apologizing now for that. So we're, we're, we're good with that now. Um, so in, in this new phase, I guess I was inspired when I tried to do something more meaningful. And I started, a, you know, um, being involved with the charities in Africa. Um, okay. where we were putting some digital content into schools out there. And you, you, I guess when you see poverty in the, in the way that I saw it in India and Africa for the first time, you, you're really driven and say, well, you know, how can we do something? How can our industry do something that's going to make a dent towards that? And, and I think when you look at it from that angle, you, you try and build something very different to when you're really trying to make an impact than when you're trying to build something to sell. So, you know, in the first versions of Fuse, I, I think we saw two challenges to try and solve. One was around the content. You know, how do you move away from this place where the content is boring, takes a lot of time, and the output's not so great, and it's, it's pretty boring? And second, how do we create the type of experience that's more akin to what we're choosing in our consumer lives? So from a platform perspective, you know, the really, really early days of Fuse, you know, 10 odd years ago, I guess it was, in essence, YouTube plus LinkedIn. It was the peer-to-peer -peer learning elements of YouTube with the social functions of, of LinkedIn inside that. And that was that was the kind of the, you know, the initial early stage goals before we started adding the the, the layers we have on top of that. But then I think actually what made those early clients really work for us was, and also our, our you know, our, our charity, which now is is touching a million, two, two million kids every month, is we rethought the content, the content build piece, which is something we, we explain and we give to clients as methodology. So um, the ability to record the expert live, um, cut that up, make, you know, animated videos, get that out there. So in essence, for an organization to be able to digitize the tacit knowledge that exists in its organizations, both with tools that exist in the product, in the product, but also know-how that we give into the organization. So, so for us, I think it's about um, trying to mimic some of the things we're choosing in our consumer life, but also recognizing it's a marriage, right? Also between content tools and and, and technology. So, if I'm hearing you right, then part of the platform is not just a distribution channel for content, but also an authoring, if you will, an authoring tool. Now, is that authoring capability unique to just specific users? Is that democratized for any of the users? How does that work? You want to go for uh, Reese? Otherwise, I'll, you know, I'm like, I talk way too much. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, to, to answer the question, yes, it, it is potentially available to everybody. You know, we've got flexibility in the system, so clients can use it in different ways. Um, but ultimately, you can uh, share links, you could create your own content, whether that's videos or screen recordings. You could even create your own articles, your rich your articles as well, if you want to. Okay. So there's many different ways to be able to author that. Um, and, you know, and if you don't want to get necessarily into the authoring process, you can always just upload a PDF or a, a PowerPoint. Um, but just one of the things I wanted to add to, to what Steve was saying as well, I think the, one of the biggest shifts for me was really moving away from the idea of the course to, um, to the idea of micro learning. You know, and, and there's so many different things in our system that, that takes advantage of that now. So, you know, rather than having all the knowledge that you need in your business contained within a course at a subject level, being able to split that out into proper micro learning assets and have that structure, and then be able to search and discover through that means that people now, rather than having to sit down for an hour or 30 minutes and take a course, they can simply search for the answer that they actually want, and then they're able to find that answer and go back to their job. So, you know, when I think about learning in the flow of work and all these, uh, you know, everyone's talking about that, that's really what I think the exciting thing is, is how do we just, you know, make learning and knowledge available at the moment that you need it to do your job to a really high standard. Okay. And then maybe just to add to that just really quick, so I think beautifully said, and to, to add on top of that, um, for me, when it really works, right, when I say, God, that's it, because there are moments, obviously, as an entrepreneur, when you're, I've got this idea, I think it's going to work, and <laughs> you, know, you, you see the usage and you see it being used and designed in the way. But I had an e email from uh, Charles Jennings a, a couple of days ago. He said he walked into one of our clients into a, a Vodafone store, uh, asked the person, he knew they were a Fuse client, and asked him if he used Fuse. And, said, and the response was, yeah, it's 10.30, and I've used it three times already this morning. He went back again another time a week later to use Fuse. Yeah, use it all the time. And, and that, that to me is the change we're trying to create, right? That, that they don't, and if you walk to that store, they wouldn't call it a learning tool. It's just a thing they need to do their job. But to get there, that central, and it's not just about us because that central team of Vodafone has done an amazing job in terms of creating the content strategy in the right way, keeping a drumbeat of regularity towards it, 
um, you know, baking it into how people are onboarded, that they're using it. But the end result is what we want, which is, you know, 75, 80 percent weekly active usage over a five year period uh, um, yeah. and people baked in their habits to search and discover every day. OK, so uh, let's let's dig into that one a little bit, because I think that's a really important topic to discuss with things is, you know, it sounds like and I don't know how much you can share about that client specifically, but anything you can or if you can talk about it more generally, because I think that's an important topic to dig into is that you know, buying a buying a tool and throwing it at something isn't isn't going to immediately solve all of your yeah. problems so where you've seen really clients get the most out of it what are some of those things that they're doing that's differentiating them from maybe somebody who buys it and goes well we did it and and we're just not seeing anything happen and, and that's a great question right and look and, and you could look at even in our client base so you could look at two clients in the same industry and one is smashing it and and one is you know, is, is not on that same path. And, and ultimately there's like four or five things, right, that, that come into that, um, both with the same technology. So take that out of the equation. Um, one is the thing you mentioned, the content strategy. If you're building long form content that people are never gonna search for after they consumed it, you're already killing one of the most important elements of modern day learning, which is let me search and find and discover when, when I've forgotten, back to the example we gave. So that's the one. I, I think two is, is then the, how do we design for, for, for learning that's gonna be impactful? You know, how do we design for that? So moving away from um, being an order taker from the stakeholders, so the stakeholder historically coming in, I need two courses on sales, I need to train 2,000 people, and the measurement of success is 10,000 people have gone through the, t the two courses. Towards actually the, the quality of conversation that learning business partner is going to have with that stakeholder and say, actually, look, what are you trying to achieve here? What's the vision you're trying to get to? What does that feel like? What does that look like? How do we measure that? So it may be, you know, a radical different part towards it. Well, actually, it's about performance or it's about connection to the company, but it's onboarding. You know, there's a, there's a different output to that. So once you, you change your North Star upon what your measurement looks like, and then you start to design all the things around the content strategy, you know, task-based learning inside that and all those components, um, then I, I think you, you get to the second bucket, which is you're now designing learning that people want to be engaged in because you, you're trying to achieve a different outcome and a different output. Well, different outcome towards that. So I think that's the uh, to get there though. And this is the third bucket. I, I think is around the skill sets of L and D. So you, you can't you can't maintain the same skill sets of 15 years ago and expect people to be able to to change and create those experiences, to create the content, to have those type of conversations with it. So you know, often we get asked the, we ask the question, say, well, what do we need and what role would we employ? And say actually, the first new role is probably a videographer, storyteller, animator, someone that's going to be able to talk to the experts in the business extract out the great explanation and put that back the same day in a way that other people can benefit from that learning that learning business partner is going to be able to have you know that type of quality conversation so your skill set piece your content strategy piece um the platform piece and then obviously data right you know data is going to tell you data analytics it's kind of critical to be able to look at that to understand that when you are starting to move forward and move the shift what's working what's not what do we do less of and what do we do more of okay that's well and that that's a big that's a big answer to that question. And I can't get to where it, it, well, but it is. And this is yeah. And this is a challenge I think we're all working, we're all working through right now, right? Is is how do we how do we make that jump? And some of the things that I think are the biggest barriers to it is the mindset shift. I mean, this is a this is a whole different way of thinking for L and D. And I think there's this is, this can create a bit of an identity crisis for the way it's always been done. Yeah, and I'll be honest, right? So if I go into a networking event with chief learning officers, I'll, I'll simply listen to the language to work out who we should be speaking to. Because you're thinking, well, you know, you're listening, you're like, you want to be there, you just don't know necessarily how and don't have the tools, versus, wow, you, you, your mind's not there. It's gonna, you're a couple of years away from getting there. And you know, in a change curve, um, you have to accept that people are on different journeys and, and different paths. But you're right. I mean, the mindset piece is key, but so are some of the technical skills inside that leader's team. So it, it, you can't just have a great transformational CLO if the skill sets of their team are, are still used to creating manuals and, and basic courses. Yeah, completely agree. Completely agree with that one. Um, so so with this one, one of the things I'm, I'm curious how you articulate this, because the reality is in the space, there is no shortage of players out there that are saying, hey, we're, we're the next generation of, of the LMS. We're, we're the new learning LEP, LXP, LDP, right? I mean, there's, there's no shortage of L something yeah, yeah, yeah. acronyms out there. How do you articulate how you differentiate yourself against other players who may be saying they're doing similar or the same things? Yeah, so, so 
And I think the first point is valid, right? I think every week an analyst gives a different a different category name, so it's got to be so confusing. I, I think for the um, for the market out there, like, I think in essence you've probably got two types of players, really, right? You, you've got uh, products like us that are trying to be, let's say, the hub of the learning ecosystem, you know, and then we're, we want to bring in really cool other players, that, you know, into us that that do niche things. And then you probably got kind of niche others, other suppliers. I, I think that are more specialists in there, you know, skills management or you know, content creation and so forth towards it. I think that's where it's going to end up. You know, I think in our place, you know, we, we're quite kind of unique in that whilst the market is finding itself and finding the, the right end part, you know, you've, you've got these. We often compete directly against the LMS, and we have that LMS functionality. We have event management and all those type of things, and we turn off a. Cornerstone or LMS on a regular basis as people want to move from first gen, first gen to second gen. Um, but then at the same point, you know, we go, we compete in the LXP category, um, even though we wouldn't necessarily label ourselves as a pure LXP, because I guess our vision isn't about, you know, curation as the uh, curation of skills is the main thing. Uh, our vision is around performance. And sometimes, you know, sometimes skills and competence isn't the way to get to performance. Um, but it is a different approach towards it. So I think the market is still still work itself through to where we get to i don't think the lxp category is is the final second category right i think the third wave is closer to where probably what we're doing uh, um and that's and that's the technologies that ensemble the different functionalities you need to drive that business impact okay okay so shots fired the lxp right <laughs> you're you're ahead of that you're ahead of the get current <laughs> So, so I want to talk about what you, one of the things you mentioned just now was, right, this whole sunsetting of a traditional LMS and, and you're seeing some of that happen because the reality is from a practitioner side of the house, some of this stuff, it, it's not a flip the switch. Hey, yeah, we want to think differently. We want to change the way we do it. So we're just going to turn off everything we've done from, from all the years of everything and just start over. We don't, we don't have the luxury of having that blank canvas. How how do you see or what have you seen work with that transition and, and what are some of the things that you know your platform may help people with in terms of stepping through that? Like, well, we need to meet you where you are while at the same time setting you up for success to move forward. Chris, I think that's a great question. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Reese jump in because he's been the, the practitioner yeah. doing that, right? I, I think at the at the high level, it is about the speed you want to run the journey at. So some people want to be a speedboat and they want to run into kind of the next generation world, start straight away, move away from big content and straight into micro content, searching, discovering, building out academies and experiences and that type of side. But others absolutely saying, hey, look, we, we, you know, we need to get some basics in place, right? We've got nothing. So we still need to make sure our directors don't go to jail, you know, with compliance. We still need some basic event management. We want to get to this place. So I think, you know, for companies like us, like us it's how do we partner with the company, understand the pace that they want to run at, and then make sure we adjust ourselves in accordance to the goal they want to get to. So, if somebody wants to use us as a as a as says that I want to move from my you know, basic LMS system, whatever it happens to be, you know, into the new world, but take take time. Then, generally speaking, say, look, you might want to only migrate ten or twenty percent of your content, you know, from the old kind of course scorn courses. I guess we would prefer if they start building out the non compliance courses in a way that's going to be modern, right? So, take your baby steps, take the first programs. Look at those first programs and then partner with us to us to help with some of that mindset shift or partner with some of our our partners like the 702010 institute who you know who are really good at kind of like that thought leadership piece in the early stages but then others who want to just like go fast right i want to be where your smartest clients are then we also want to make sure that we can run at that pace as well so i think there's just that that flexibility side and probably reese you probably works in both organizations absolutely yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the from, from, stories, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, as the product guy, I actually, I, I don't think the answer necessarily is product. It's a marriage, right, of services and product. You know, I think that's something we've really tried to focus on because we understand just how much of a monumental shift, you know, um, culturally it is in the learning team and then within the business as well. You know, when I first brought Fuse in, I'll be really honest, I was fairly naive in that I thought, yeah, I'll be fine. We'll just start creating some content when we launch it and all that as well. Um, but of course, then what we were doing is moving across the traditional way of living, you know, and, and, and therefore the traditional content. And that, that doesn't make sense. You know, what you've got to have is the right skill set in there. You need people that understand that it shouldn't be a 30, 60, 90 day cycle to create a single course. Because the problem is, if you actually want to affect the business at the level that we're trying to talk about here, then you need to be in the trenches and building content in the moment that helps people in that 
from it as well, because the business have a problem they need to solve today, not in three months' time. You know, so that's that's for me, that's why micro learning and, and what we're talking about here is so important as well. It's changing that mindset from let me build something and in an agile approach where we can build something, get something out there and build on top of that as well. And let's build it in a way where knowledge is available now and in the future, you know, through searching, discovery and, and structured learning as well. You know, for me, that, 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 that's really, really important. And our services team really helped to try and shift that mindset and take all the best knowledge from our clients and then start to bring that into the process as people get onboarded. Okay. Okay. Where have you, because I think this is, it's, I've been part of it myself where you learn along the way a little bit when you, when you implement some of these big things and, and there's no shortage of landmines that you can step on in the process. Are, are there certain things that you, know, you can encourage people with or, or things that you can look at to say, Hey, the, these are some consistent things that we see where it's going to trip you up if you're not ready here. And, and these are some steps you can take to be ready for, you know, whether it's Fuse or any sort of transformational learning technology that, you know, you really need to be proactive on. So you're not halfway through and go, holy smokes, what have we, what have we got ourselves into? Yeah. Do you want to take that, Steve, or do you want me to do that? Well, I'll start. Take it. <laughs> you start, I'll finish. There you go. <laughs> So, so I think we've touched on some of these things before, right? And, and it's about taking it, because you mentioned the thing, it is transformational, it is about change, right? So you, you've got to view it that way rather than about implementing a piece of technology. Because you, you, you're right, you know, it doesn't matter who you do, it's us or someone else. And, you know, you know, we obviously, we, we've we got an opinion about Fuse and we've seen it being, being transformational in many of our clients. But as you said, sometimes it, it hasn't been inside there, right? And then, you know, recently it's been interesting to go and talk to some of those clients. And, and they've got the will and desire, but it's the know-how. So, you know, sometimes it comes down to, hey, look, you know, I, I buy this, but I don't know how to create content other than a school course, right? So yeah. I need some help with that. If you're not, if I don't get the help from that, then I'm not going to be able to move into that world. So I think that, you know, that piece is critical. I, I think the, how you talk to the business stakeholders is, is critical too. So if you've got the same, if it's the same old language of let me accept uh, orders and the building of courses towards it, and it's a 12 week program to build my course, then I distribute it, then, then no technology is really gonna help, right? Which is a shinier front end towards it. So, so I think that transformation is the same for L&D as it is for any other organization going through digital disruption. You've got to view, okay, how do we, how do we go on that journey ourselves? How do we get the whole of, of the L&D team um, to upskill themselves, to think differently. Um, and, and that's not just about the relationship us, but it's also probably being part of a community. So one of the things we're really, really big on is um, getting our clients together, both virtually and physically together to learn from each other, because you know we're learning from them as much as they're, as they're learning from us. Um, recently, what we're doing now is we're just starting our own Fuse Academy, which is just trying to digitize the best practice from, from our customers and why they're getting it right, so that other people can copy them, replicate them, and ask them. So I think, yeah. Um, Reese, to you. <laughs> well, um, I, I suppose there's a, a couple of things for me. You know, I, I think sometimes the other thing in the room is that the L&D team are not the experts, right? You know, they, they, they don't have all the answers as well. And so to put it on them to have to create a course um, that then is going to transform the business isn't always the right thing. And that, that really, the, the partnership that Steve was talking about there, you know, it, it, it's so crucial. Um, I, I think that, that that really starts to get that change going however let me give you a practical answer as yeah. well you know so uh, so for me um one of the things that i think that works really well in clients is to start small you know so rather than try and boil the ocean and have every bit of content in there and you know and, and try and build all of that in you know two three months actually take a learning program do what we just talked about. Start from the actual business outcome that you want to achieve within that particular program. Because the great thing is there's always sponsors at an exact level that, you know, if you find the right program that are really interested in the outcomes of this, and it helps you to start by a place and a seat at the table so that you can start to make that transformational change. You know, if your core business is around sales and you've got a sales enablement program or something like that, then being able to take that, digitize that, make that available to everybody, be able to measure the impact as well. I need to potentially put the business data over the top of that to show how people are actually performing after they've taken the learning really helps to accelerate. But I think if you can do that, then you can start to repeat and then it rolls out and it can scale from there because you'll get more buy-in, more resources, you know, and more yeah. time. And, and, you know, and then you're not an order taker anymore. Suddenly you're telling people this is the best way to solve this business issue rather than, yes, we've got a problem with, 
you know, compliance and we need to roll out the state of security course. And maybe just to add to that, so I th- and I think that's brilliant, but I think it's perfect in what Reese says. And I, I think, um, I, I think to, to add to that, I, I think if I look at some of the clients that really have gone on for years and years and years to maintain success in, in what they're doing, they all started with what we said. They always started with one program, be it something like onboarding where the goal was time to competence or sales, where it said, actually, how can we prove um, you know, the, the, an average transaction sale that that's gone higher, but to really laser focus in. And in that first program, you get to live the new experience of digital, right? So you get to, you, you get to gain some of the experience inside it rather than maybe, um, and this is where I think, you know, it kind of goes wrong sometimes other people thinking, you know, I've got an LMS and I haven't got much engagement. I'll tell you what I do as I'll, I'll go and buy uh, a library of content that will solve my engagement problem. Yeah. Wow, I'm still not getting the I'm still not getting the, the engagement level towards it. I know what I do. I buy a tool that's going to create all the content on top of that, and we're going to move around all the shitty content to different people to get to the right places. And, and then they're still surprised that the engagement levels aren't there. I think this move to more programmatic approach, right? Saying what's the big learning intervention that's happening, which is majority still face to face. How do we how do we rethink every new version of that? So we're re- and thinking about how the L and D team and the training team are involved. And one of the biggest things actually re- recently we've seen a lot of our clients really see the difference in is as their trainers move from being purely classroom trainers to really accept the role in the digital way. So that they are online coaches, digital coaches, they're being trained, retrained themselves to be digitally socially savvy. And you know, with this company in the UK, uh, I think the training company, one of our partners, and they as they've changed that role of their apprenticeship coach. They've got 400% engagement you know, on the platform for apprentices, which is staying longer in the programs and achieving their, their goals because of that relationship. Um, so I think, yeah, I think there's, there's, there's lots of great war stories, I, I think, to share that. Well, and, and you hit on something that I, I, we talked about it a little bit earlier, which is spot on. It's a bit of an identity crisis for L&D professionals when you look at it. But the reality is when you dig into the things, it's not that the role we play is disappearing it's that it's changing the way we execute against that so just like you yeah. said instead of being a training specialist who's facilitating a class it's not that that skill set is no longer relevant it's that the exercising of those skills is is looking very different and it's about kind of saying well okay now how do i execute against that different way of doing the thing that i'm really good at or talented at versus saying well i'm no longer relevant i don't have a place here and i think that can be helpful in that but you know, I, I think part of that as well is um, the, the reality that, that today, if you want to be really great in learning, you, you have to be uh, omni-channel. You know, so it's not about doing something in the classroom and then doing something that's digital. It's actually how do you combine those things and how do you make the right program at the right time? You know, I, I think sometimes we forget that and then we go, let's push people to the LMS or push people to this platform. You've got to get them in. They'll go there actually if there was a reason for them to go there right. as well. But you've got to give them that in the first place. And you know, good learning programs that show um, that give them the knowledge they need and actually demonstrate that there's value because everyone's time is precious. It doesn't matter whether you're a CEO, you know, or your cell phones on the shop floor. Your time is really precious, and you've all got to. Yeah it's the hit and so you need a reason to go there so so with this one because this is this is where right, we're talking about all these different mindset shifts and another one we've we've touched on that i'm curious your take i've got a very distinct opinion on this one but is you you hit on the fact that this letting go of the fact that we aren't necessarily always the ones that everything has to channel through right we're, we're almost kind of empowering empowering the organization saying, no, I'm not necessarily the subject matter expert. I don't have to be the function that creates all the content for the organization because the reality is we can't with the timeline. I mean, it's just, it's operationally just not possible, but that is a comfort with letting go of kind of being the owner of that. Now at the same time, and this is all about the balance piece, I've been involved and seen it firsthand where things swing way too far the other way And I think it's one of the dangers of some of these rapid authoring tools where people are just have no guidance from learning and development and they're creating terrible stuff, but they can create it so easily now that they're just churning out garbage. And it's like, well, now you just have a digital landfill. So how do you balance that? Or what's your take on how you balance that so that you're, you're creating quality stuff, you're empowering the organization to do it, but that it's not getting out of hand or what, what is that balancing act look like for you? So, so I think I think there's a couple of tips to that we've seen, right? So again, what, what some of our clients do, and I think it's a, it's a great idea. So on the user generator side, because obviously in our platform, you can press the record button, make a screencast and have some basic editing thing. And you can make some really awful videos, 
right? So you could be monotone and you can be 20 minutes long uh, and you can have some animated gifts that really- You cannot have a lamp with a pillowcase, right? <laughs> they're, they're talking about me, guys. They're talking about me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, um, we can little make a bite-sized video for next time to make sure the rest of people learn. Uh, yeah. About yeah. Um, so yeah, to that point, right? So many of our clients, they we help them and, and uh, other people, they do it themselves, produce literally five, 10 minutes of best practice. If you're gonna make a video, here's five, 10 minutes of best practice on how, how you do it well. So at least you are helping digitally in a large organization uh, to do that. I, I think the second thing is, is the recognition, the partnership now between L&D team and, and the business. So it is a partnership where, as you said, the, the role becomes more about facilitation. And specifically, I think we're talking on the social learning aspects here. So the the you know, so the person says that I'm not, uh, uh, I've got a great idea or I've got some stuff I really want to share, but how can I minimize my time to be able to get that out of my head and into into something of value? And that's where some of these new skill sets of L&D, like the videographer and the animator come in to say, hey, look, that's what we do. You know, many of our clients have a person that say, we're going to come down, spend 15 minutes of you, put you under a camera, ask you the right questions, catch you digitally in terms of you giving us a, a good audio stream. And then we can play around with that, cut it, cut your 15 minutes down to three minutes and make you think you're irresistibly concise. It's a hard job to do that, right? But that's that's the job of the professional. You know, the person says, wow, I'm really concise. Yeah, it was a tough job to make you that concise, but that's what they, we, we now do. And then put some nice visual layers across it. And some of our clients are doing this in two hours, right? So as in talking to the expert and getting their stuff out there in, in, in within two hours. So, and, and that's got to be critical and relevant for today, right? If you look at just the reality of the landscape we now live in, you know, software, I was at ServiceNow the other day and they're saying, look, we, we release every three months and it's more or less a new product. Imagine all of the people in that ecosystem need to learn that stuff every three months. You've got, you know, beauty manufacturers um, releasing new products every three months in their campaigns, every three weeks in their campaign. Software manufacturer, you know, software car manufacturer like Tesla doing upgrades to the software in the cars. It makes it work differently every six weeks. So the old model of let me spend 12 weeks creating a course to get stuff out there. It's, it's just irrelevant in a world where corporate knowledge is doubling every 12 months and the human yeah. knowledge is doubling every 12 hours, right? Mm -hmm. So it has to be done in these ways. And, yeah, and the final point to the point there is, therefore, the role of L&D to be more, how do I help you do that? But also, how do we give you tools, but also help you use those tools, I think, are critical. Yeah, Sorry, Rick. Absolutely. No, I'm just going to, just to add to that, you know, there, there is flexibility within the platform to, to help to try and alleviate some of these issues as well, you know. But be, but before I touch on that, I think, when, you know, I, get, I got used to get asked this question all the time um, when I was trying to, to roll fuse out as well, you know. And, and there's a couple of different different answers here, you know. Yes, you know, you could have a system that has a really rigid content creation process where you have to have everything signed off. But what we find straight away is that, that if you try and put it in that funnel, people don't bother because it has to go through so many different steps as well. You know, so what I found quite a lot of our clients and what I was doing was managing by exception because to be honest with you, the, 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 the thing that yeah. the content that they create and the things that they say in that content, it happens in real life. They just digitize it. So yeah. it's not, it's not like saying, you know, make these videos suddenly that doesn't happen in the business but at least by digitizing it and getting in front of the right people people can also challenge that and help to educate those people as well you know i i think for me that that's that's such a, a, a important point we, we think if we hide it then it goes away and it, it doesn't well and what i've seen what i've seen and i i agree with you on that for for two reasons one i've found when i've done user generated content when people are engaging with it, your users actually do a better job of policing and ma managing that stuff than you can ever do through traditional compliance means. If, if things go out that are incorrect, people are all over it. They're, they, you know, they're, you're, you're actually leveraging the power of the network to actually curate the, you know, bring the right things into light and bring the wrong things out. Yeah. I think the other thing that's a little bit interesting about that is sometimes we're so afraid of what users will create and that they'll create bad content when the reality is we're guilty of creating bad content all the time right? like if we're being honest about it it's like we create bad stuff we're not perfect we don't get everything right so why would we have an expectation that well let's not have users generate anything because they won't do it right well okay and i and i think the point you brought up about coaching and developing right our role is changing we're becoming in many ways consultants to the business to say, hey, let us help you do this because to your point, we can't keep up. You know, you talked about the life cycle of creating a course. 
think about the life cycle of a bigger talent initiative. Well, let's spend months creating a competency model and then let's align our competency model to everything. And then we'll curate the content to align to. And then two years later, you've rolled out a thing that is now completely obsolete to what you actually need in the business today. Well, and, then, and, then you, and then the business asks you, what's the impact then of that? And you go, uh, why would you ask us that question? Right. right. Uh, um, so I, I think that's why when you start asking the question at the other side of before we do this stuff, what impact do we want? You, you radically take go down a different path. And um, and I think that's why this Academy's concept is taking such a such a good run. Right. So, you know, the parts and then the platforms like us where you can create these different experiences for different audiences with the relevant tools for it. Not just say there's one tool, which is content and courses. Some of that may be observation assessments. Some may be task based learning. Some may be bringing content from the outside world or some maybe it's really important that we bring internal knowledge in. So I think there's this academy approach where you're able to design different experiences relevant to the impact that, that you're trying to create. For each audience is probably critical to move away from skills and competency frameworks, which are taking us forever, skills, competencies, and courses, and, and which are probably in a place where you even look at some of like engineering skills, right? Well, they used to be a hundred years, you know, change every 35 years. Now we're down to it's changing every two and a half years. By the time you finish rolling out your model and get your courses aligned towards it, right? The actual the jobs have changed. Yep, completely. It's and and that's where we have to change. We have to change. It's not a well, we should, or it's it's something we should focus on. It's we have to if we're going to stay relevant. Mm. Um, so on this one, and shoot, the question now slipped my mind on this. Um, but so on the reskilling, well, actually, no, I'm gonna go in a different direction with this. So with this piece, one of the things that you know we talked about was this the workflow learning, right? We're learning in the flow, workflow, it's another L and D buzz. You know, yeah. when you talk about that, how are you defining that? Or what are you seeing clients when you say, okay, so this content's reaching them in the flow of work? Is it are they still reaching it through fuse? Are they reaching it through their what does that mean and what does that look like? So, so I think so both, right? And I think again, the there isn't a one size fits all because even in the same company, even like say a you know supermarket retailer, head office are going to have a different set of tools they use every day. Their their workflow and their flow of work is very different to someone working on the shop floor who doesn't have access to a PC. So you know, um, and the central team might be using some central chat system like Slack or or MS Teams, but actually down at the workforce, they they don't have access to that, right? Yep. So. Uh, there isn't a one place fits all. You know, back to the example for the retail to hospitality. In that place, you know, our our app is kind of becoming the place they go to. to say, okay. I don't know how to do this. What's my job? And that's why that person's looked at it, you know, three times by ten thirty. In a desktop based environment, that's much less likely. You have to accept the fact that your your platform is probably not going to be the place they go to open up and log in. So that you have to make sure that your technology is going to be able to be surfaced where they're going to be in, in multitude of ways. Sometimes it's just um, if someone's using Workday as an HR system, then it's it's surfacing the content in the right places. Same as in Salesforce, the ability to search in Salesforce and, and it bring in uh, the, the content is relevant. So both browsing and, and search is kind of key. So I think, again, you've got to look at the landscape and, and even the landscape for mobile first companies. You know, we someone like Avon for us, which is you know five million learners across the world. You know, they had the main company app and we're deep linked into that app. So, you know, when you're getting to one pass towards it, it's easy to jump out and have that that connection between between two pieces. So you've got to take, I think, the experience of what learning is trying to do and plug it into those different places. And maybe the final point is, but you're still back to that content piece, right? That if you're still building, and this is where I think, you know, some of the other guys get it wrong here, right? That if you're still believing that people are going to be, you know, doing learning the flow of work to access a course, then that's just crazy. Right. It's just the same as like discovery on the way home. You don't go home and think, what course should I sign up for tonight? It yeah. might happen once or twice a year. And the same is people don't in their jobs think, oh, I want to get back to that thing that was in the course and let me browse through my course to get to it. That habit is, is not going to work. So I think you've got to go back and say, what are the new habits we want to we want to plug into? And, and therefore, if, if getting at, back access to the, the content, we've got to rethink our content strategy. You know, it's the old world is not going to be relevant in this new world. And then how do I create curiosity? So someone like Scanic Hotels talks about it as um, uh, spending five minutes a day learning. So that how does the right content surface, the micro content surface towards that? But then, and the last one is, I uh, said the last twice. And the last one is yeah. then. <laughs> Two last ones. Um, <laughs> and a great idea of, a, of um, a client in the US for a, a large residential. They they do um, 
Tuesday, Tuesday. So they make it an event, right? Tuesday, Tuesday is a thing that they do. And they, they try to create the experience and trying to create the place, but create some buzz about that stuff as well. So I think different strategies for different organizations. Yeah. Well, and, and every organization's culture is is going to be a little bit different. So there isn't a, you know, top 10 ways to make this effective in your organization because your organization has its own nuances. Well, um, it, exactly. I, I, yeah. sorry, sorry, Chris, you might have, I, no. just, just on that particular point, I mean, I, you know, for me, workflow learning is about taking learning to the user, you know, and, and it's a core tenant for me of the integrated learning platform is that you have a platform that's flexible enough to be able to integrate into whatever your corporate ecosystem actually is. So rather than you having to go buy a new suite of tools, you know, if your IT team had bought certain things in and you're fighting with them, like Yammer is always a classic example, always fighting about, you know, do you do things in Fuse? Do you do things in Yammer? Why can't they coexist at the same time as well? You know, do you have that flexibility? in terms of integration Connect the two. that's the world i think that we're moving to you know is yeah. that you've got to be able to work with other people and then push the learning on or i suppose change the access point that's, that's what i was saying to somebody the other day yeah. is that rather than having to log into your lms or interviews or whatever then if you're if you're on slack you know and you need to access something in the, in the moment you should be able to do it there and then well and that's one of the analogies that I've I've used in the past that some, sometimes kind of curbs the cuz I I've, I've heard the thing we we're trying to create the one place everyone goes for everything and that's like saying I'm going to create the one app everybody's going to yeah. delete all the apps on their phone because they're just going to have my app and they're going to go there for everything. The reality is people don't actually even want that. If I had one app and had to do everything in it, I would not I would hate it. I would I would no longer have a smartphone. I'd go back to my Motorola Razor and be perfectly happy with that. So I think that's where, you know, reaching people where they are and recognizing. And again, that's a shift in L&D to think it's not about us. It's not about what we think is the place people need to go. It's about figuring out where they're doing things, where they're accessing things and getting to them. Absolutely. And to add to that, I need to combine a couple of points there, right? So I think, again, I'm slightly back to that, that content piece. If that mindset is we're building courses, you're never going to create the habit that, that we need, right? So for us, I think the last couple of years, so because of the few school piece where we digitize the chemistry and physics and mass curriculums into, you know, 250 individual videos and concepts that people are searching on YouTube. And that's how the kids are accessing it. And that's why the million, two million kids a month are accessing it, saying, what's an atom? They're not going back to the chemistry or, bi or biology course. And therefore, I think, where does the innovation come from industry? It's got to say, look, that's what people expect. So, you know, our level, our, the, the, the stuff that we're now doing, building out the next year is to go that ne next level down. So now with Google, if you search on where does a blue and red wire go in a plug, you don't expect to find the content, you expect to find the answer. And I yeah. think, again, that's where we go with our context taxonomy and that marriage between content, um, between content and technology. And then your piece is, how do we then surface that in the right place right. relevant for them? Right. Because if you're just using it, an example, I was talking with Raj from WalkMe last week and we were talking about, you know, what WalkMe does. And, and I've seen firsthand an example where someone used a performance support tool like that. And all it did was push the e-learning courses from the LMS to people. And it's like, that's, that's, you, you're, you're just not thinking about it the right way. Yeah. yeah. So on this topic, going back to, to measurement and impact, you know, Chris Caseman brought up a good point in the comments, and I think we're, we're getting towards that. And I'd love to hear what you're seeing with some of these organizations, because what we're talking about is more than just, hey, this is neat for L&D. But when you think about the fact that the need for people to have new knowledge and skills faster than they ever have before, and the old way of doing it, waiting months, sometimes years to be able to actually deliver on that. That's not just about improving the user experience from an L&D standpoint. That's that's bottom line going to hit, you know, results in a in a business. You're you're going to see differences in that. What are you seeing with some of the folks who are really getting this right, you know, and how that's making a difference not only in the business but even in the reputation or the perception of L&D? Yeah, so I, th I think the I think so I think the first thing the first it's it's a simple thing, right? But it's a huge difference. The first thing is is thinking about that measurement before you start, yep. not you know, middle or end, right? A lot of the time, the question is asked at the end of it to say, what's the impact, right? Which is, uh, it means you probably haven't thought about it in the whole design process. For us, that's the first thing, right? Once you're crystal clear on what the vision uh, um, that you're trying to create for this learning program, whatever happens to be a sales program or, or a, um, a customer care program or a leadership program, what's, what's the impact, right? What's the impact we're trying to create? What's the problem we're solving? 
And then, okay, well, how are we going to measure that, right? So if we could shift the dial, so, you know, certain things are easier. Sales is probably the easiest because you can point to anyone in the sales room and say that person is 17% better than that person over there. So sales is the easiest, but, you know, anything services led has NPS scores and things towards it. So, you know, on those programs, you know, you might, you may look, for example, what some clients look at time to pay back. You know, it's an interesting one. So, you know, if you're measuring what time to pay was before, it might be on, you know, when people are on board, it might take six months. And actually, we want to get this down to three months. How do we measure that um, in terms of that, that paying back? It could be the delta of difference. So the delta difference is what's the high performers um, uh, achieving in terms of their KPIs? So what are they converting sales at? What are they achieving NPS at? What are they doing there? What's the median look like in the organization? Okay, so we can close that gap. If we invest in this thing and design a, a learning performance experience that we think is going to close that, how much do we think we can close it by? Obviously, the first one you do is going to be more assumptive. The more you do, you start using data to say, well, we can look back historically and know, you know, it is interesting, right? It's interesting. There's a, a, data, a stat that comes out continuously. We look at some of this stuff in the sales, uh, the sales part, and when we do the basic of, let's say, bottling the greatness of the best people and giving that knowledge to people and giving the ability to get back to it. Generally speaking, it's funny, right? Because it's still kind of event-based. And what you see is an increase of about 30% in the KPIs, which is amazing. But then actually, because you still got that kind of forgetting curve type stuff, it ends up over the period of months, you know, getting down to about 10%. Obviously, if you design it more as a holistic learning experience, then you can put more interventions in the social learning part, the repetition part towards it, um, observations, coaching, uh, the task-based learning activities in order to say, actually, we think we can maintain that 30% and increase it with a bunch of other stuff. So as a quick summary, the, the first thing is thinking of, of that measurement in advance. Yeah. Second, the second thing is then where does that data come from? So you probably need two data sets. You need the business data set and then whoever owns that needs to be your partner for it. And then obviously your assumptions you're going to take out of your learning data, which may be things like including how many times people are going to search for stuff or how much, what's engagement look like and have people understood it? Have, have they completed the tasks that go with the digital things along, alongside that? And then obviously the correlation piece. A lot of our clients today are still doing the correlation piece outside of our platform. So they're putting it into a Tableau or the main kind of, yeah. you know, um, data top. that data out of the system then combine yeah. it. Yeah. So we, we, we push that, you know, via either, you know, APIs or other types of things. But that's where the correlation happens. But once you've got the levers, then we say, okay, great. Now we can create the dashboards and our learning platform and we can look out for the levers. We know the big lever might be actually when we coach people once to understand it, God, that's that's the thing that really turns it from 10% to 40%. So I think you get the correlation to that. You know, in the future, we'll probably do the correlation inside. Right now, it's kind of normal that correlation happens outside, but then that allows you to build your dashboards in our product because then you're saying, now we know, we know what levers to look out for. And then fine tuning them with um, you know occasional correlations. Well, and it's it's funny, I think it was maybe a week and a half ago, Kevin Yates and I were talking about this on here about measurement. And it's it's always been interesting to me because people are, they've always struggled with the measurement piece. And to me, the missing component has always been, well, you have to start with what you're trying to do first and define that stuff. Then measurement's really easy because yeah. you can start to say, well, if this is what we're trying to do, I think too often we do the thing and then we look back and go, well, what was the impact? And you're like, well, that that makes it near impossible and nothing more than a, a best guess. Yeah, and I think it's also painful too, right? Because yeah. you know, so many companies I've seen do that on mass, and they look at their data, and, and it comes out most of the time as zero, right? Right? Because sometimes it has negative impact. You're taking people and you're putting people through a five day course um, and out of their work when actually they just need maybe 10, 15 minutes or something. Yeah. So you know, when you when you you're not thinking about it, you make some horrendous choices. When you're north star is that that business impact and that measurement piece. I mean, and I loved, you know, I loved um, one of our clients, Hilti, when they, they asked that question, they said, look, we've got the payback time to six months. But because the question was, well, what can we do to get to three months? That's a, that's a question because the North Star was six months. If it was the output was, how many people can we get more than another 10,000 people through the course? They would never ask that question. And therefore the things they were able to experiment with and trial, yep. they can see, did that make a difference or not? So, yeah. Yep. Well, no, in a case study, and this is where getting into that data and figuring out what are the actual behaviors that are driving those performance impacts are huge because once you can actually identify, and you can't get that from completions, you just can't because you don't really know what's happening with that. You know, I think of a good example, I can't remember what company it was, but it was a shoe company and they discovered that simply asking parents when they came in, can I measure your child's feet, had dramatic impact on sales of shoes because that was the challenge. But if all you know is we just need to get more people in the door did we have more? You don't know. You don't know whether or not you're actually changing the right things. But then you can simply measure that. Right? You can then say, okay, what if? Yeah. You know, how, 
could we measure if we gave every, the same thing we heard one in the telecommunication company they were looking at one individual in a, in a place and said his sales of, of broadband which is what they were trying to push was through the roof so they went down there and they asked him and said well you know they, they saw this guy walking around the, with a broadband box and they, and they said to him why well, you walk around the broadband box oh we sell broadband now can i tell you about it i mean simple and genius right? yeah. but then when you say okay well what would happen if we gave, let's say, 20% of the organization, you know, they understood that, just understood it, not even embedding it, but understood it, what would happen? You can measure that, right? And yep. all the data exists in the business to, to go do that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's just, he said, it's shifting the thinking of, oh, it can't be done because it's never been done and there's too many variables. What you hear is there's too many variables to be done and it can't be done, which is, I think, just a lazy answer to, towards it, right? Which means that I'm a little bit scared to find out the truth. Well, and to acknowledge the fact that sometimes you're going to pick the wrong thing and that's okay. We learn from it. And, and that fear of failure is something we have to get more comfortable with to say, look, let's take our best guess. But at least if we can measure it, we can say, we thought it was this. We tried it. We measured it. It didn't work. Let's then reset. Let's pick some other things and let's try that. And I think that's the journey that we need to accept as an industry. We go on together, right? It's, yep. There's a friend of mine who was the HR director of, of, of British Telecom a long time ago. And he got asked by CEO, uh, and his CEO said to him, how much money are we spending on training? Where's it working? Where's it not? Where do we spend more? Where do we spend less? Everyone should, should, we should be able to get to a place to answer that question beautifully, right? And I think we're eight, we do have the technology and know-how to be able to do that. At the time, I said, what are you going to do? Because I've got no idea. <laughs> I've got, you know, brought in a bunch of consultants for a couple of months and came out and he says, look, we know how much we're spending now. We have no idea where it's working, where it's not other than in intrinsically. And he yeah. probably went back to that company. They probably say that, you know, they probably say a similar thing today. But there are companies out there that are saying, look, we're not, not only going to measure everything. If we don't believe at the beginning of a program, we can't make an impact, we're going to tell our stakeholders no point doing it. If we don't think we can dial it, why, why would you do that? Better to invest in an area where we do think we can make an impact. Yeah. Well, and you know, is, one of the one of the, um, the, the the problems with this area as well is the is the end you know the, the entry barrier into this. You know, in a lot of cases, L and D teams don't have data scientists that can sit there and and do anything complex. So that's why we end up doing completions and page views and all that kind of stuff. Is because that's all we can manage in Excel. You know, so I think the great thing is, is that we're, we're on that journey at the moment where we're trying to build a set of tools that, that democratizes data and allows you then to create really great, beautiful insights that you can really start to ask all the great stuff that Steve was just talking about within the tool. And then if you want to take it out and correlate it with business data or eventually bring it in and then correlate it in the actual tool itself. And for me, that's, that's where, that, that's where the, the gold dust happens, right? When you can right. do it yourselves. Well, and this goes back to the whole thing we've been saying from the beginning it starts at the beginning because if you're still building SCORM courses that only give you completion data, you can hire all the data scientists that you want to look at your completion data and throw it in a nice visual dashboard. But at the end of the day, you're still just gonna know we had this many people finish the course, this many people passed or failed the test. The ones who passed probably just hammered through the quiz enough times until they memorized the answer. So it really doesn't tell us much of anything. I can't believe you used democratizer data. I love that. And I can't seal it now because you did it live on air. <laughs> <laughs> I keep, keep it, keeping them all for this. <laughs> Just quote me on it. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> um, so we're, we're, I told you we were going to come out. We were going to come to the end and we were still going to have, we could keep going for much longer, I'm sure. But one of the things that I do want to do, I know that we, you, you have some of this stuff pulled up, Reese. I'm sure there are people out there, they're hearing this conversation saying, great stuff. I, I love what's going on based on the comments, right? People are, are chiming in. But I think one of the things even myself is curious about is what does some of this stuff look like? You know, what, what does it actually look like? And we don't need to do a full blown demo, but you know, let's hit on some of those big things so that people can get a feel for the user experience. Um, and and I, know you've, I know you've got it prepped and ready to go and, and I can pull that up when you're ready. Great. Okay. Well, let's do that now then. Um, so, uh, all right. just let me know when you can uh, you can see the screen. All right. We are here. Great. Okay. Well, welcome to Fuse, first of all. Um, <laughs> but, be, <laughs> but before I, I, I dive into this particular bit here, I just wanted to talk a little bit about a really important point, and that is around creating beautiful learning experiences. You know, so if I just show you some examples of, you know, this is our one of our internal instances. You know, but you've got 
client instances where you are able to add a, a beautiful okay. amount of flexibility into it as well and really build an experience that services the right knowledge and the right um, call to actions that, they, that people actually need to be able to do their job more effectively as well. You know, so I just keep showing you certain, you know, Yeah, so just examples. looking at this, it has the capability to do more of that really customizing it to your organization versus the it's out of the box. This is, it looks the same regardless of who you are. Well, here's the kicker, right? So that this is one view of what you see, yep. but actually you can do this on an audience basis. Okay. So rather than it, it being purely around Not even the a entire one, company. one for the whole enterprise. Absolutely, yeah. So the sales team, because in reality, the sales team need different call to actions to a marketing team. Yep. You know, so you are able to craft a real experience and a, a real jumping off point into whatever you actually need. Um, so, so you can do that across the, across the site. You can have it as hierarchy and team based, or you can have it, you know, role based. For you know, if you have um, lots of similar roles like sales consultants, you can have a screen for them, and you can even just do it customized based on on your own data. You know, whatever other data point you might have when you bring in the system, you might want to create an audience from that as well. Okay. So, uh, one of the things I really wanted to touch on as well, we talked a lot about social earlier yeah. on, and um, you know, for me, communities is. A core parts of, of Fuse and how um, and how we segment and create unique experiences for everybody. You know, so I've, I've just, logged, just logged into our customer success community. This is available for all of our, our clients. Um, but the idea behind communities is, is that you can, this is a place for content, but it's also a place for people and you can mix and match. So you could be a member of multiple different communities. You then have access to multiple different um, items of content. And then rather than having to do that laborious LMS thing of, you know, having to create a catalog and then create categories and all this other kind of stuff, you can get on actually with the, with the, you know, the, the job that, the actually you paid for and it really brings value to the business. You can simply make the right content available to people via community access as well. So, it, you know, for us, from the admin perspective as well, that, that's also a huge thing. One of the things that I love, and I was able to scale up this really quickly across a 45,000 people business. Um, yeah. You know, so that, that that's that's another kind of area to just to talk about. And you can see here, we've got things like recommendations, widgets, and, you know, your learning plans are over here as well. And you're able to cycle through those and, and all that's really good. But you know, we, we, we hit a couple of times on being able to search and discover and get access to knowledge in the moment that you actually need it as well. You know, so uh, search for us is a, a core tenant of how you can get into that. We do have structure, and I'll come on to that in a second. But for me, it's about how do I jump in and how do I find the answer that I need to be able to do my job? You know, and then if I've got time at some point and I want to learn more, then I still have the ability to structure. So okay. I'm just going to search for, you know, universal analytics, one of our, the, the tool we're going to show you at the end. So this is the bit that I was kind of, um, uh, like touching upon when we talked about data just then, you know, so uh, you can jump into a learning plan on universal analytics in the system. So, you know, this is where you do get that structure. But search okay. really is is that kind of simple ability. Yeah, to it's looking a little more traditional in terms of right the way it's laid out. Absolutely, yeah, and, uh, exactly. And, and the way that we work is you know tagging, and there, there's some intelligent algorithms that look um, at the the title description, but also you know, in, in, we're looking at. Um, descriptions and, and translations and all that kind of good stuff as well to make it even more intelligent. You know, search for us is a, a you know, really big this year. Um, but in terms of the learning plan then, so you, you've got your, your traditional structure. It's nice, easy. You know, you can just get back to where you actually were. If you've dropped out of a learning plan, you want to come back in. You haven't got to find, you can just click continue. So you know? I've got to ask, because I'm seeing this and we've only got a yeah. couple of minutes, but I'm, I'm seeing this and I'm very curious. So you've got the social connections in with it down at the bottom. So I see LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. Are you seeing, are you seeing people actually leveraging, right? Do people, do people really connect in with their, their external kind of personal stuff in addition to this? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, in, in, in so far that you know, on LinkedIn, people will take articles that are on LinkedIn okay. and make them available and expose that knowledge within okay. Fuse. You That's can really, really, really easily do that, you know. And actually, I'll, I'll show you that next. You know, so you know, when you log into the learning plan, you know, this is a key part as well. This is the idea of micro learning. So rather than universal analytics being that course, you know, it really is about just how do you break down into that micro asset. So if I just want to know how to access it, I can just type how do I access it, and I can find this piece of content. You know? Got it. And then talking about what, what, going back to what you just mentioned there, you know, content creation for us is also key. So here you can ask a question again, you know, purely around knowledge and focusing on that. You can put a link into the system. You can create an article. Okay. You know, that, that link could be anything. Content. Exactly. Yeah. You know, or it could be you know links into third-party um, content providers as well. If you just want to curate a few things and not bring the whole thing in, okay. then you could just focus on bringing those URLs in, and then SSO does all the rest of the stuff. Got it. Um, 
And then I suppose the, the other bit I really just wanted to talk about as well yeah. um, was showing a bit more around content. You know, so one of the key things for us is uh, is how we can really help to leverage that search piece that we just talked about. So if I just jump into uh, if I just jump into a video here, when we create videos and you upload them, uh, every video gets transcribed automatically okay. out of the box. There's nothing for you to do. You know, and then you get a transcription here. Uh, but then what you can also do once you have that transcription is you're then able to translate it into uh, 36 different languages today, 40 languages in the very near future as well. You know, you can see here you've got lots and lots of different ones, and you, you know, it really is as simple as being able to say, hey, add, you know, add a new subtitle, uh, you know, add a new subtitle from you know, okay. English. Sure. So that people can see the subtitles like in that. their language. So from a global standpoint. Exactly. Got it. Exactly. And then it's, it's one piece of content that you have to manage there because then what you can do with universal content, that, that's our main basically language version, is you can make it available in the language that they want. You know, so if it's a video, you could upload an English and a German and an Italian version. And then if I have Italian set as my default language, I just see the Italian version. It. It's just really it's simple. Pulling it all you know, it's pulling it exactly. All Okay. Simplified content management, right? Yeah. You know, and, and for me, that that that's the key thing. And I know we're nearly at time, but it's just one more thing I really wanted right. to You're have really to quickly cash. show you, right? <laughs> Which is universal analytics. So they, for me, this is one of uh, you know the probably the biggest thing we released last year. Uh, look at that. Let me just do it a different way so I can get you in really quickly. There we go. Um, so what you can do within here as well is you are a able to then see 310 different data points. So we collect a, a huge amount of stuff on, on you know, uh, users, on content, on learning plans and completions, um, you know, on things like observations as well. So if people yeah. use the observations tool, you're able to see really quickly and easily, you know, uh, events at the same time. You know, there's just lots of data visualizations, but the, the real hero story of this is what we call the analyzer tool. So we built all those insights, but what you can actually do here is create your own insight. You have access to all those 310 different data points and, and you, you are able to build anything build you want. And, and kind of customize and pull those pieces together into what's really relevant to you and your business. Exactly. You know, and if a stakeholder or you know a board member asks you a question, you, you're likely able to go in here and build a story because that's effectively what you're doing. You're creating an insight which is showing you. Yeah, exactly. Got you it. Know. So that, that was the really, really super short. That version. was the, hey, I, I know, we, we got to move fast, but hey, yeah, I, yeah. That, that at least helps contextualize some of the things that we've been talking about and, you know, what does it actually mean to do some of these things and what does that look like as a, as a back-end user and also a front-end user? So this has been, I, I really appreciate the time. This has been great to, one, have this conversation to talk about these things and the chance to get to know Fuse and uh, and both of you a little bit better. So I know you, Steve, you have a, a very important birthday to get to tonight. So I do not want to be the person that prevents that from happening and getting into trouble. Um, so, yeah. So, so thank you for the time. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks everybody for watching. Hopefully this got your questions answered. And if not, right, we know there's more. Feel free to, to comment, tag, you know, ask additional questions and, and we will get those answered for you. So thanks everybody and have a great weekend. Cheers guys. Bye.